myself a cup of that rich Folgers aroma. The best part of waking up, it's the do up do up in all I do. The mountain gold aroma always coming through. Always coming through. Oh, the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. All right. A couple things with this video. First of all, I love Rockapella. And if you don't know who Rockapella is, stay tuned to the end of this video and you'll find out. The other thing is I get to introduce you to my new friend, Justin Wells. He is the face behind Justin's Morning Coffee. And I got to know Justin through YouTube and Twitter. And we go into that a little bit in this conversation. But one of the other things that we get into and really the reason that we decided to jump on this call is because we have actually been working on a project together. It is a co-branded collaborative project around his coffee brand and my coffee brand and it's called Justin's Morning Coffee. We go into a little bit of how we uh, collaborated on this and then maybe most excitingly how you can buy a bag if you'd like to. But if you're not really into coffee and you don't want to hear the story about how he learned about coffee and fell in love with it, you can skip ahead about 25 minutes or so and you'll get into a deeper part of our conversation where we talk about his love for movies, the different projects he's worked on as a cinematographer in Hollywood over decades, as well as what he's hoping to do in the future with his storytelling and teaching efforts on YouTube. So without further ado, my man, Justin and his morning coffee. All right, there he is with with definitely a better camera than me. Although I did upgrade my camera slightly, uh, Justin's morning coffee, and it is morning. And yep. I think I saw you just taking a, a sip of coffee. What are you drinking today? Well, I there's a little um, shop down the corner here, a local roaster called Jones Coffee, and uh, okay. they, they sort of. I'm in I'm in Pasadena here, yeah, outside of L.A. and um, they they sort of supply a bunch of little coffee shops, Burbank airport, you know, they're kind of a little local roaster. They're uh, more of a second wave place with these okay. two kind of well-rounded blends. And I usually just walk down there. I like, I like to, I don't like to drive if I don't have to. And so sure. I, my, I, I kind of keep a, a one square mile radius when I'm, when I'm off work and I just walk down to the coffee shop, pick up a pound of coffee and do a pour over usually. Yeah. So it's it's getting coffee from the roaster, taking it home, and then you have your sort of at home setup with which you you make. Did you say a pour yeah. over? Is that what you're drinking today, or, or most yeah. days? Yeah, yeah, most days. I I had a buddy who um, he's into anything sophisticated you could think about in terms of the palate. You know, wine mm -hmm. and beer. Uh, we were working on a a, a a documentary on Belgian beer together. Um, but including coffee, cigar, scotch, cigars, anything that you could say like is sophisticated on the palate. He's the one who kind of like taught me about it. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, old college buddy of mine. And he, he said, listen, he goes, you got to have a gram scale. You got to make mm -hmm. sure that you can scientifically repeat the ratio of water to coffee. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you got to use a burr grinder so that, you know, you can repeat the, the, the grind, you know, like all that. So I, so I have a little setup. It's just a, you know, a, a, a pot with a temperature on the top of it with mm -hmm. that uh, goes down the uh, pour. I don't know what you Is say. Is it a gooseneck spout. kettle? I guess that's what it's called. Yeah. But it goes to the bottom I, and it's got a little red mark at 200 degrees. And mm -hmm. um, I just kind of find the, the, um, the temperature and ratio that works for me for whichever brand of coffee I happen to be drinking at the time. So we, we may have just lost half or, you know, over half of the people watching this who aren't, you know, coffee nerds. And then there may be other, you know, even deeper coffee nerds that, that could, you know, critique whatever language, you know, we, we're, we're using talking about coffee right here. So, but you hit on a couple of things that are really intriguing to me of, of I kind of now want to hear maybe even more of, of the story uh, around you know, was, when, when did coffee first enter your life? That's kind of maybe what I want to ask. Was, was it before, you know, this, this college friend and um, maybe, maybe bring me up to that moment when it, it became, you know, a little more sophisticated. Well, the, the reason why my YouTube channel and my Instagram and my Twitter 
is Justin's Morning Coffee started, um, you know, because I work on movies. I travel around the world um, for work on movies and commercials and TV shows. And I remember there was one guy who said, I, I, I always want to remember where I am. And so he had a certain hmm. photography ritual that he would do every time he traveled. And his was to look out his window wherever he was staying and do a picture from the window of, of the hmm. hotel or the apartment or wherever he was staying. And I was like, I should do something like that too. And I love coffee. I've always loved coffee pretty much since, since high school, college on up and, and, you know, researching the different ways of coffee, the different, you know, all that stuff. Even, and, even um, way back then in, in, in high school, you were, you were researching it. it, it the, like the, the well, science and the history behind it was interesting. College, I would say. College, okay, college okay. and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I, I like to get coffee when I travel too. you know, mm. espresso, you know, whatever it is. And so I, I, I developed a ritual. And so if you go to my Instagram page, which is Justin's Morning Coffee, you, all you're going to see are coffees from around the world as a foreground object in, in, in the photography. So it's yeah, like yeah. wherever I am. So sometimes it's terrible gas station coffee because that's where I am. <laughs> Sometimes mm -hmm. it's uh, a little bit better coffee from the, maybe the caterer of the movie that I'm working on. And sometimes it's at a specialty coffee shop in Budapest or, uh, uh, or Greece, you know, what, what's the one they have in Greece? It's called a cafe Fredo, which is the iced coffee mm -hmm. that they make in Greece, okay. Turkish coffee, um, you know, Italian espresso, whatever it is. I, I, I like to just explore the different ways that people, because every culture has like a certain way of making coffee. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. And um, if you go to Italy, for example, you're going to find you're not going to find drip coffee. You're not going to find pour right. over. You're, not gonna find, you're just it's going to be just espresso based. It's going to be cappuccinos, lattes, um, you know, espresso. It'll give yeah, you a you, little. The, the closest thing you would get would be an americano because yeah. the Americans sort of insisted on this sort of larger volume. You know you know, yeah. closer to a, what a drip coffee or something like that, that, that we, you know, might have that we can maybe savor a little bit longer. Yeah. I know you and I overlapped in Europe a couple months ago or th thereabouts. Like, I think you were leaving about the time that we had arrived there and we had a, a similar experience of what we prefer to drink at home and the trouble in finding it, e even in France and in, in London. Um, so has, give me a sense of, how adventurous you are with that morning coffee. Are you, are you looking for the thing that you're used to on a menu? Um, the, the, the sweet spots that you, you know, maybe uh, you'll, you'll be able to taste from those beans, or are you looking for something that's maybe more culturally specific, like a, a when in Rome kind of spirit? Oh, definitely. When in Rome. Yeah. Like wherever yeah. I go. I, yeah. I like to try the different, just what, what do you guys like? What do you guys like to drink? Mm. That's what I want to try. You know, um, and, and I like it all coffee. I like all kinds of coffee. I'm not, yeah. so, I mean, I don't like bad coffee, but, um, <laughs> you know, but it, whether, however it's prepared, if it's a flat white, if it's an espresso, if it's a cappuccino, I might have like in certain places, I might just say, okay, a cappuccino is going to be my go-to drink. Mm. You know, when I'm in Europe, usually that's easy to order. It's normally mm. good, you know? Um, and, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll try. I'll try whatever, like in, in Greece, for example, you know, like it's so hot that their version of coffee, which is this iced coffee with a little bit of sugar in it, um, and usually a little bit of cream on top of it. Um, it's, it's more like a whipped cream on top of it mm. with a straw in a, in a, that's just kind of like their drink, huh. you know? And it's, I'm it's definitely great. curious, intrigued to, to try that. Now I, I would, the, the, the question I was going to ask you is, do you consider yourself a coffee snob? Um, but it sounds like the way that you are so open to, you know, different, you know, methods of, of, of brewing or serving, um, it sounds like that would not be the case. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're open to anything, but you can still appreciate the, the, the finer things, having a more sophisticated palate, perhaps. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to anything, but I can tell the difference between a good version of that thing and a bad version of that thing. <laughs> now, do you, fin do you finish a bad cup of coffee or are you... Uh, you know, so refined in your, your taste to where you're like, Ugh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out or it, do you still sort of, 
finish what you pay uh, for and or or at least you know try and get the the good caffeinated benefits from what whatever it is that you've committed to it depends on what i'm doing if i'm working <laughs> and i just need some caffeine then yes i'll finish it <laughs> but if i'm if i'm off work and i want to hang out at a cafe for a little while and it's a bad cup of coffee then yeah i probably wouldn't finish it you know a lot of people i think remember their first cup of coffee as being bad or being a um, a necessary evil, or th there was some sort of promise of an effect that would come from it that was not based on its delicious initial taste. Do you remember some of your early tastes of coffee being good, being, being bad, lots of, lots of milk, sugar, like what's taking me back to sort of how coffee became something that you enjoyed the taste of or, and, and, Maybe it started out day one. No, I, it was started in uh, high school, and it was when we were doing these very long road trips with the baseball team. The baseball mm -hmm. team or the tennis team. I grew up in Mammoth, which is way on the eastern Sierra, five hours north of L.A. Mm -hmm. And so when we would play a baseball game, we'd have to drive a long ways to, to get to wherever the next town was. And I just would go into the gas station, and I'd want to get – the benefit of some, some caffeine. So I had started with half and half hot chocolate and <laughs> gas station coffee. Yeah. And I slowly noticed that I was going, um, I was getting less and less hot chocolate and more and more coffee. By the time I got to college, I went to college in Orange County and Orange County is, it has a lot of good uh, coffee culture. And it was during the pretty much the Starbucks renaissance, you, you could say, mm. of uh, third wave or second wave coffee, I guess you'd call it. Um, and so, uh, you know, once I started writing my paper, I remember we had this huge paper we had to write, everyone was scared of it. And I would get up super early in the morning, brew a cup of co a pot of coffee and work on my paper. And it became kind of a ritual of um, when I wanted to do sit down and do some serious thinking and writing, I would always have coffee. And ever since then, I think that's been, it's been a regular thing for me. And, and you would get, uh, would you get that type of, you know, extreme focus and, and, and clarity and, and, you know, the, the classic, you know, stimulant effects um, from, from that and, and utilize that for, for performance, you know, in, in some ways, a performance yeah. enhancing uh, morning drug? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just to get, you know, get, get all the, get, get the, the mind think, you know, buzzing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and, and I think I, I was still using, um, you know, some sweetener and some creamer, uh, in co in college. And it wasn't really until I started to find, um, I think probably, uh, more temperature controlled, um, mm. brewing and maybe, uh, with brewing with better water, which takes away that kind of bitter mm. aftertaste so mm. that you could have a really smooth cup of coffee. That's when I started going, I don't need anything in it. I just want to mm. taste the coffee. And that's, Was I this really, yeah, I was gonna say, was this with your friends sort of, uh, you know, coffee mentoring or, or, or hand yeah. holding and encouragement? Yeah, like when, when he showed me how to do a pour over, that's when I realized, oh, okay, like if you control the temperature and you get yourself a good brew and, mm -hmm. and you make sure that the water is, is, is good water, um, then you, you can bring out the flavor of that and it's going to be a, a, an amazing cup of coffee, just black, you know, and, and that's mm -hmm. how I drink at home. I, I don't have any creamer or sugar or anything that I put in, in it at home. Do you, do you happen to remember, um, the, the country of origin or was it a blend or the roast level or any other details from mm. that first, uh, that first transcendent cup? I don't remember, but I do, I do remember kind of when like the, the third wave stuff was mm. kind of coming in and starting to get popular here in LA, there was intelligentsia coffee, mm. blue bottle coffee, um, a few others that were a, more light roasts and they would do a pour over in, um, in the shop. And, yeah, yeah. um, and, and that was really like, you go, yeah, this is, this is, this is great because the light roast is even more caffeine, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. it's like you feel even better. And then, um, and then it's a super smooth drink. And, you know, like I was telling you on, on Twitter, um, I'm not super into like really acidic coffee, but, mm. um, but I, I will enjoy um, one cup of of a little bit more yeah. acidic, a little bit more tart um, flavors, which is kind of like the fad today. I think of the some of these trendy coffee shops. Um, yeah, yeah, I just can't drink a lot of it because it, too much acidity will 
will uh, m you know mess with my stomach but sure uh, yeah that's that's the you know. downside of when when you can get to the other side of having to add a lot of milk and cream and just drink it black the downside of that is the effect of the acidity on on my stomach at least and and i've heard you know from others kind of something similar so then it's kind of dealing with volume or acidity levels and, and whatnot so yeah you you alluded to our our conversation on on twitter and so yeah like like you said your your kind of platform is it's it's in filmmaking and cinematography and storytelling but then sort of this very specific explicit you know coffee sort of brand that's associated with you and so um i my my wife and i own uh, a handful of coffee shops and we, we've begun roasting our own coffee beans in acquisition of of the coffee roaster that we had worked with for a long time as well and it seemed like it would be interesting to explore, you know, some sort of partnership with with your brand, you know, sending you some samples and maybe finding out something that would be sort of a good representation of your brand. And so we did, I think, three or, th or three and a half, maybe um, rounds of, of, of beans and samples. So what so tell me, first of all, how you received that first um, suggestion from me and sort of maybe how the, the process ha has gone with that. I thought it was a great idea. You know, I mean, um, I've always fancied myself like I, I, I think of myself as having a good palate, you know, mm. when it comes not just with coffee, but with with other beverages, you know, and, uh, and food. And um, and so I've always had an opinion about the coffee that I was drinking and and like I told you, you know, I I do like the new, more uh, lighter roast, um, uh, uh, more of a kind of a, you know, exploring the flavors of it, um, mm. of of whatever varietal. I don't know if you call it a varietal like you would in wine, but whatever. Yeah, yeah we do. Whatever, okay, whatever varietal of bean, really kind of exploring and unlocking that. And, and there's a lot of little coffee shops here around LA that do that. And they'll usually, it'll be single bean origin. And they'll say, you know, here, this is a, this is a Guatemala and this is a mm -hmm. Nicaragua, whatever it is. Um, but, but again, like I always thought maybe I could find something like that, but it's still blended a little bit mm -hmm. um, to, to give it a more well-rounded, um, a well-rounded, you know, palate. Um, yeah, it's yeah. kind of, to me, it's sort of like when it's blended, it go it it goes down smooth and when it's when it's um when it's uh i, I it's a like a sharp origin. edge when it mm. yeah like sometimes mm. it'll have like like this flavor one flavor will kind of stick out and that'll yeah. be kind of like the thing that defines that cup of coffee and that's fun when you're exploring and you say hey oh, i want to try something sure. interesting it stands and out you'll more, go, more clearly yeah and you'll go wow that's an interesting one but i don't know if you'd want to have it every morning you know yeah. so that's kind of what i was thinking when i was giving you some ideas of, of what a, a blend that, that sort of like fits my uh, preferences would be, would be something that is kind of like a little bit more third wave, a little bit more of a light roast mm -hmm. um, and having different, um, not just coffee flavors, but maybe some fruit notes, maybe, you know, some fig notes or something like that, uh, but not too acidic and blended. So it's a little bit more well-rounded. So it's like an every morning type of a coffee. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of um, what I just said. I, I mean, I didn't know if that was possible. I just said it to you. <laughs> well, and I, I'm of the um, the school of thought to where I, I lean a lot more towards people's sort of subjective experiences of something rather than some sort of objective, this tastes like strawberries to everybody or something. It's more like, mm -hmm. this is what we tasted these are the notes that we picked up on but your you know your mileage may vary and you may get something else out of it and to me that's what's sort of sort of most important is like this is what you tasted in it and so we were gonna you know throw several different kinds of blends at you to see if any of them got got close to that and then from your notes we're able to send another round you know varying things a, a few different ways different origins different roasting levels and then you know kind of finally you know landing on on the one let's see i believe what we landed on was a honduras ethiopia and kenya blend is that right yeah and yeah. and and all three light roasts mm -hmm. and all three i believe the same the same process yes which was yes. The, uh was it natural the natural uh, yes uh, the well 
See, now you're putting me on the spot as to which right. one was which. I, I may have to put a little note here at the bottom of the screen of yeah. which one was natural. I think one of them was a honey process. Yeah. And yeah. Um, again, we might be losing we might be losing yeah, some of the non coffee <laughs> nerds here. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the processing levels kind of have to do with how much time it takes and how much of the fruit of the coffee um, the, the mucilage of the coffee fruit, the coffee cherry is what we call it, how much of that sort of is on it and dries either naturally or is immediately washed off. Those are kind of the two different extremes of uh, the wash versus natural. And then a honey process is when some of that mucilage is broken open and torn off. And it's it's kind of somewhere in the middle. And there's like different levels of honey. And you have people that go down very, very deep rabbit holes of the nuances between coffee beans and the, the elevation, you know, in which they were um, grown, uh, the time of year that they're harvested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right. For you, have you experimented much with the um, grinding styles or um, preparation styles that, that you've found some that maybe you, you don't like? Like, have you messed with like an arrow press or a French press or... Um, you know, other, other forms of, of coffee brewing at, at home or, or, or uh, out, out, out and out and about, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I don't mind a French press, but I, I just, I prefer the pour over method just cause it, like I said, I can control everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I don't wind up with as much, um, sludge at the bottom like you yeah. would you know like the, the most obviously the, the one with the most sludge at the bottom is the turkish style yeah. coffee yeah. where they just it's you just have to wait for it to settle and drink off the top of it yeah and be <laughs> careful like, there, there's no yeah. last chug of, of yeah. a turkish coffee or i guess if that's what you're into but it's that's a different experience you'd be chewing that yeah and um and then just as far as grinding goes i mean i just found that it like you can set on a burr grinder which is crushing it instead of a, the, the one, a blade, the, um, yeah. a blade, which is just chopping it up. Um, so you can repeat it. That's the main thing is, mm. you know, just that you can repeat it. So if you find like, Oh, I, I ground this a little too fine and I'm doing a pour over, but it's taking a very long time to go down through the, through the filter. Yeah. And that's changing how long the water is in contact with the coffee. So yeah. you'd say, okay, well, next time I'm going to do one click back from that. And yeah. then, um, yeah. And and even we've noticed sometimes things like just the the humidity levels in the air, like the, the times of year, like our, our, our grinds. Well, there, there's not just like, here's the perfect grind size setting, go for it. You're constantly having to adjust that based on things like temperature and moisture level just in the air. Um, when we first started our coffee shop about eight years ago, that was the biggest surprise to me if I would have had to guess as to what was the most important things, uh, elements of coffee making, I think that the quality of the grinder and the quality of the grind size would have been a lot lower on my list just intuitively. But then we, we kind of quickly found that it was maybe the most important aspect of differentiating between, between tastes. So I don't mm -hmm. know if you had, had found that, uh, found that as well and have, up, upgraded your grind. Did you ever have a blade grinder? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what I started out with. And and then at one point I was going to do a hand grinder. I was like, I'll just, mm -hmm. this will be cool. And then it was too much. I was like, I'm not going to do this every morning. <laughs> yeah. So I got we, an electric one. <laughs> we have a hand, we have a burr hand grinder that we use at our house sometimes. And we, I, I like kind of specifically have to trick myself into turning it into an act of service and an act of love for, for my wife. Like, it's like, mm -hmm. this sucks. This is hard. This is time consuming. Um, and so I'm going to do it, you know, with a, with a smile on my face and warmth in my heart out of love as, as an act of service. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, it's no joke, <laughs> especially if you're doing it kind of, kind of yeah. every day. There's, there's these balances between convenience and excellence and, you know, you kind of find kind of your sweet spot and go from there. Right. So, um, one of the things I, I want, I want to make a, a shift a little bit to sort of how we got, got to know each other. Cause there's tons of people with coffee, you know, in their, you know, brands and bios and whatnot, but we found each other in a, in a unique way, but I wanted to show you a couple, couple things you might get a kick out of 
Um, so we make our own labels kind of in-house. We can do this whole branding thing. And um, my friend, my friend, my, my coffee roaster, Ethan, he did this for um, a buddy of his, a hopeful buddy of his, a guy named Andy Squires. Uh-huh. He's a musician. Oh, yeah. And he's That's coming cool. to town and he decided he's, he's going to have a concert together. And this is, I guess, maybe an album cover. Mm-hmm. And he... And this is, I think, another like a song or something. Oh, cool! My, yeah. my camera's trying to track my face, and uh, yeah. I'm trying to get it away from my face. So I told him, I showed him, you know, your Instagram and YouTube channel, and he came up with a couple, couple different maybe prototypes of what. Oh, uh, really? Oh, let's see. What your bag. <laughs> like, like, I needed to track your face on this bag. But, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. he did. He did this this one as well. Oh, cool. Oh, that's So that's funny. just like yeah. stuff that he just, you know, was able to kind of whip up. But mm-hmm. I guess coming soon and, and maybe it, by the time, you know, I get this published, we may be able to have it live. But people will be able to sort of order, you know, a, mm-hmm. a coffee that was sort of custom curated by you. Got the, uh, mm-hmm. the Justin stamp of approval and uh, then, you know, send pictures of people can send yeah. pictures to you of them, you know, enjoying it themselves. So. Uh, I appreciate that you were, you know, game for this, this process and uh, hopefully it's been, been fun so far. I know one time we sent you the same round twice. We had like a little, yeah. little mix up with our, with our shipping, but Hey, you got a couple more, you yeah, know, it was okay. Cups of coffee it was, it was out great. of it. <laughs> yeah. Ha- happy mistakes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, cool. Well, I, my, so my channel has this sort of from coffee making to meaning making kind of like su- subtitle. And mm-hmm. um, it's actually called Zach Parsons projects, like trying to acknowledge that I am often, if not always, projecting meaning into every experience that I have. And so, a lot of times, um, I will try to try to confess and articulate things in terms of of meaning making, and I tend to have a high meaning making uh, approach to things. Um, and I got that term from this group called Rebel Wisdom, and their big thing was also around sense making. And so I fell into this whole Rebel Wisdom world, which had um, a guy named Jordan Peterson, who many people have heard of, <laughs> and uh, then exposed to a lot more thinkers. And one of those was was Paul Vanderclay. And in the last couple of years, since Rebel Wisdom has closed down, I found myself even more kind of drawn into to his world, which he calls this little corner of the internet or TLC for short. And mm-hmm. I think that's in, in one of those videos where I was first introduced to you and you, I believe have uh, been working on or maybe even completed a, a documentary um, about sort of the, the creation of this little corner. Am I, do I have, am I projecting too much right now or how many yeah. of those details do I have right? Okay. We'll see how, I'm not sure if, how good it is, but I do have something, yes. <laughs> okay, but it's, but it's, and it's, it's live, it's out there, it exists, or it's still no, in, in development? No, not yet. Yeah, it's okay. only a few okay. people have seen it. Um, I'm still, it's, I'm not sure where it's going to land, but mm. um, I, I just, um, so, so I met Paul, uh, I, I ran into Paul on YouTube a little bit after COVID. I was okay. kind of at home, like a, a lot of other people, having a lot of time to think. And 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 I'm in I'm in L.A. He's up in San uh, Sacramento, and mm-hmm. um, I I am a member of uh, one of the Reformed denominations, mm-hmm. um, and and he's so I so I know about Reformed theology, um, and and so I kind of he was a familiar. I studied under um, Richard Mao uh, at. Fuller okay. Theological Seminary okay. um, for a while. And so that that world, like Richard Mao came from Calvin, uh, Calvin College, and yeah. then over to Fuller, and Paul was from Calvin. And Calvin does a lot of um, theology and culture stuff. And since I'm a movie guy and I, I, I work in Hollywood, you know, thinking about story and narrative, you know, so, so they, I've always drawn a lot from them. And Paul just has a way of, uh, of engaging with whatever people are – talking about in our, mm. in our world and our culture with a lot of wisdom. 
based on all of this experience that he's had of, yeah, yeah. of, of working things out with people in church. And, uh, and he just has a very, he has a way of sort of cutting through all of the, you might say the BS involved in these conversations yeah. and finding kind of a, a very, he just, and that only just comes with time. I think yeah. time well, and his experiences in uh, the Dominican Republic, I think, you know, shaped, shaped a lot of that as well. And I think he's at least a second, maybe a third generation pastor. So sort mm -hmm. of seeing those examples, you know, in his, in his lineage um, have sort of prepared him for viewing the world, his meaning making, you know, is, is maybe, you know, dialed up to, to a high uh, level as well. So, so initially it was, it was just through YouTube, like, um, mm -hmm. you're consuming him. You hadn't yet uh, connected or, or reached, reached out or anything like that at that time. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I am definitely somebody who, um, wants to find good, um, high resolution dialogue partners. Um, one of the things that I think is similar in my world and Paul's world is that if you grow up a little bit separate from the culture where you're just not your, your family or your, your, uh, your community isn't accepting everything, every narrative that comes along and trends, mm. uh, hook, line and sinker. There's always a little, you know, when the next popular book comes out, you know, when the next, it's, it's not, you're not quite just, you're not jump, on jumping board. on it immediately because that's got it. Yeah. This is and why that, you've that, never seen The Wire, right? The game is out there, and it's either play or get played. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I still, that, that just, it just kills me. I, with all I've learned about you from afar of your storytelling structure and character yeah. development focus, I just, I, I can't wait for whenever it happens, whether it's another pandemic or something where you sit down and say, all right, I'm going to start watching The Wire. And uh, I, 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 it, I, I always... can't wait for you to experience that. <laughs> It's consistently Sorry, I, I, rated. Yeah, as one I, I, I derailed ones. you there. Sorry. No problem. No problem. Um, so uh, anyway, so so Paul, I, I found it just to be a very, uh, you know, a, a very um, refreshing um, set of conversations that he was having on his channel, which you mm -hmm. can't always get uh, with just your in your day to day life, your coworkers, yeah. your friends, whatever. And um when he started mentioning this thing called the Estuary Project, he's like, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the Estuary Project. I looked it up and I saw that he had a buddy named John Van Donk who lives about an hour from me here. And he oh, wow. was kind of heading up this Estuary Project. Estuary Project was just getting people together to have these uh, more meaningful conversations. So I said, well, why don't I just drive out to Riverside or Chino um, and... Mm -hmm. uh, see what's going on, you know, and I just showed up one day to his estuary. And he said, Hey, do you want to talk to Paul? You know, and I said, Yeah, sure. You know, so he emailed Paul and say, Hey, you should talk to Justin. Yeah. And this was yeah. probably is in the last two years, three years. It was probably about two years ago. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. see. Yeah. Two years ago now. Yeah, maybe two and a half. So you so you have a, a positive estuary experience. Um, but it's about an hour away from your house, I, I guess is, well, if you're well, in LA, than, that's not <laughs> with traffic, it's two hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I, okay. I don't, I, I still will occasionally drive out there. Um, when, when John was more, it was in the beginning stages of that estuary. Um, mm -hmm. I would go a little bit more often just to give him critical mass, you know, but now that it's, it's, it's always well attended. Um, mm. I don't, I don't make it out there because I'd have to leave it, you know, pretty early to get all the way out yeah. there by seven o'clock. Um, and, uh, but there's more people in LA also on this side of town that they're considering, you know, um, there's talk of maybe an, there will be an estuary in LA somewhere, uh, something yeah. like that, you know? Um, but that it just plugged me into the, to the, uh, to this network. And I realized yeah. Yeah. that, you know, now that the network is growing and there's estuaries in Europe and, you know, all over the United States, as much as I travel for work, I realize there's always going to be somebody in the town mm -hmm. or the city that I go to pretty soon, almost anywhere I go, there'll be an estuary there. And I know that I can just show up probably, you know, and just yeah, talk yeah. and there'll be interesting conversations. 
So cool, because at the time that we're recording this, we've just started our own sort of estuary initiative here in Evansville, Indiana. And um, we've, we've now sort of got sort of an east side of town, west side of town kind of thing. It only takes, you know, 10, 15 minutes to get, you know, from either side of, of our town. You know, it's not not L.A. or anything close to that. But um, we're, we're, we're sort of exploring and figuring out how that all works to provide enough opportunities for folks to be kind of convenient. And we, we've had consistently incredible experiences and, and, and endings, really. It's like kind of all's well that ends well. Like we just leave every estuary meeting just filled with kind of encouragement and hope and connection. And um, I, I'm encouraged. I, I wasn't aware to the extent that you were that involved in, in estuary and I, and I should have been. So um, the part of my story that I didn't, you know, go any further with was that as the rebel wisdom program started to wind down right before they wound down, they did a final, what ended up being the final men's retreat out in London. Uh, or as I, actually outside of London, it was my first trip to to Europe. And because what I really felt like I needed was more of these in-person experiences. The conversations are great, are helpful. Like this this is a good conversation for me right now. I'm, I'm encouraged by this. Um, but it would be even better if we were actually, you know, cupping a, a coffee together and, you know, maybe we go take a walk afterwards and just there there is something different about doing things in, in person. And that was a great and powerful experience. And, and we did stuff like breath work and um, there, there's a lot more that can happen in person. But then it's like you go back to your community and then you're, you're maintaining these relationships through, through digital means. And it's, it's, it's just not the same as when you're seeing people in your day to day to day to day. And so I started a local men's uh, retreat and we had a, a couple of um, meetings for the last couple summers. And now we still see these people each other in our everyday lives and we remind each other of sort of that higher version of ourselves as as humans and men that we sort of met and faced with each other in the retreat in the wilderness when we're seeing each other in the coffee shop or in the grocery store or in the school or something like that. And so you mentioned earlier about being involved in a denomination similar or this, the same denomination as Paul. So how has your church experience been in comparison to estuary? Like, is, do those things fit? I, I just asked you one question, realized I wanted to ask a bigger question. We don't really talk about your, how you grew up or didn't in church. I mean, do, do you mind sharing some of, sure. some of that? We talked about how you got into coffee, but how, how did church and God become something that was, you know, meaningful for you? Well, I grew up Christian, evangelical. Um, my dad was a pastor for for about nine years of my upbringing. Um, and uh, when I went to college, I went to an evangelical college. I majored in film. Um, but I also always have had a, a real desire to go deeper and to really, I'm very curious, high in openness, as Paul would mm. say, you know, Op you know, just really wanted to know everything, you know, and so I wound up getting a master's in philosophy um, after undergrad. So I did my film major, then I did a master's in philosophy. Then I um, went up to Pasadena, where I live now, to attend Fuller Theological Seminary because they had a very, very robust theology and art program. And I was, I'm always intersected between or interested between the intersection between art and culture and, let's say, faith. Um, I don't want to necessarily say religion, but, you know, faith or spirituality and religion and art and culture. One of the famous um, lines I use in the class, I teach a little documentary class at a, at Biola University, which is an evangelical um, film school. Oh, I, 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 have a, I have a niece at Biola right now. Oh, <laughs> well. And, and I, I, I've been to Biola a couple of times for... Um, for like summer summer camps and whatnot. So Biola and, and Ken Lowry went to Biola. I don't know if you know Ken. Yeah, I've talked to him. Yeah. 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 Um, well, it's, it's, it, it is the best film school in terms of just uh, the, the resources that they have, the, the professors, the alumni network and everything. It's really the best. Um, if you're a Christian and you want to be major in film, 
it's probably the best one in the in the country. Um, awesome. in le- except besides the Catholic schools, like Loyola, mm. Marymount, and some of these Catholic schools are also very good. But it, in, in terms of evangelical, it's probably the best. Um, the Bible anyway. Institute of Los Angeles, right? Biola. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the quotes that I use in my class is uh, by this, this re- scholar of religion um, named Brent S. Plate. And he says, dig around in art and you find religion, dig around in religion and you find art. And so the, mm-hmm. the idea is that these things are really bound together. Um, and uh, f- for those of us that did grow up evangelical, there's probably a, a lot of people that have similar experiences to me where uh, you want to do something in the, in the art world, whether that be, you know, it could be classical piano, it could be uh, painting, it could be sculpture, it could be filmmaking like I do. Um, and the category for the evangelical world it's a little bit hard to find where you belong, you know, Mm -hmm. um, not so much in in, that. One of the reasons why I think so many great filmmakers are Catholic and Orthodox, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like Tarkovsky being Orthodox, you know, Martin Scorsese being Catholic, et cetera, Mm -hmm. is that there there's the longer the tradition that you're a part of, the more of these resources that you can draw on in your, in your art making, I think. And when it's a, relatively recent cultural phenomenon you don't have as much to draw on but you can you just have to know where to go you have to kind of find it so i went on this journey you know inadvertently you know creating this um interdisciplinary education that included philosophy and theology and then finally getting my art degree from arts inter college of design here um that kind of put it all together because no one program was really doing it and you know, if, if I were to, if you, if you just walk into USC or something and you want to explore something more spiritual, let's say, they're not necessarily going to, they'll let you do it, but they're not necessarily going to help you because they don't, they don't share that worldview maybe, you know, or if they do, it's only private, you know. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think someone like uh, a Terrence Malick, who is a very spiritual filmmaker, left Hollywood for 20 years before he came back you know, and then he went and studied philosophy and he had to do it all on his own, you know? And so that, that's kind of where I wound up is, is, you know, I want to understand how it really is. You know, I want to understand how creation and the world works and how that fits in with not just the propositional intellectual side, not just the rational side, but the whole human being, the whole human experience. Yeah. The, the participatory side of that with John Vervecki's four P's. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much of that is encouraging and, and resonates. Um, when, when you talk about getting a philosophy major, my, my mind is drawn to a lot of the um, sermon illustrations probably that we both heard of. Um, let me tell you about what happened when the Christian went to a philosophy class and You know, the professor, if God exists, he would cause this, you know, chalk to fall from my hand or break. He can't even do that. So I'm using that as a silly example. How did a philosophy, you know, program challenge your 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 faith or transform your faith? Or, or, you know, did did you have something or have you experienced something akin to a a. a deconstruction or any, anything like that, any, any of that resonate in your, in your philosophical studies? Well, I, it, it's interesting to me that, I, I mean, I, people use the word deconstruction, you know, are you deconstructing a lot, you know, and um, it's an interesting term to me because most, just anecdotally, you know, most of the people that I know that deconstructed um, were like in a, in a state of no doubts, before they deconstructed, you know what I mean? Mm. It was like all in, you know, yeah. all complete just, certainty, all, a complete certainty. And then one little chink in the, in, in the, in the, in this tower that you've constructed and it all falls down, you know, yeah. like something like that. Um, it, it, kind of similar to the notion of the, of anti-fragility, you know, like if, mm. the longer you go without any challenge to the system, the weaker that thing becomes and, and, and the more likely it is to f- completely fall down. So inadvertently or, you know, coincidentally or providentially, whatever you want to say, my 
desire to go on this adventure. And I had so much fun to studying philosophy and being the odd one out, you know, mm. it, it was just, I don't know. I enjoyed the challenge. Um, I'm not threatened by those sorts of things. You know, um, it, it caused this certain robustness, I think, because what I wanted to say sure. was, look, you know, I've read the smartest people in history. You know, I wanted to be able to say that I've looked yeah, into yeah. all of this, you know, and, um, and it, it was really your head in the sand in some way. Yeah, it, exactly. The opposite. Yeah. So it, it was, it was a quite a, a faith strengthening exercise in the long run, mm. um, for me, because you just start to notice patterns of thought. You also start to notice why people say what they say. You realize mm. that when somebody puts forward an argument, that the reason why they're putting that argument isn't necessarily what they say. You know, there's not, a, not what's there's explicitly other, being said. Yeah. Yeah. There's other motivations going on. You know, there, there, mm -hmm. there's, I watched, this is a perfect example. Um, okay. The, the coolness of a believing in God shift in, let's say a period of 10 years, you know, um, I, I've told this anecdote before, but I, I, I took the, the Robert McKee story seminar. Um, this means this is a film which nothing of any substance happens, but it's full of decorative photography, right? It's atmospheric. Um, mm -hmm. when I, during those philosophy years, and he's, he's this famous writing guru. He wrote a big fat book called Story, and it's all of um, Disney and Pixar and all of these companies send all of their employees to this seminar. It's a three-day mm -hmm. seminar um, full, of, full of people. Drew Barrymore was taking it the same year that I took it you know, cool. um, other celebrities. Um, and, uh, and he did, he, it's kind of like a performance, you know, he gets, you can watch, um, in, um, adaptation, there's a, a spoof of, of, of this character. Mm. The um, Nicholas Cage. Movie. It, yes. Uh, he goes to yeah. Nicholas Cage character in, in adaptation goes to the seminar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have a long three days ahead. Years from now, you'll be standing around a posh cocktail party congratulating yourself on how you spent an entire weekend locked in a room with an asshole from Hollywood for your art. I am pathetic. I am a loser. So, um, and I was like, that's dead on. That's exactly mm. what he's like, you know? Wow. And um, so he did this big performance where he said, and it was a post 9-11 new atheist world. And he said, you know, the biggest evil on the face of the earth is religion, you know, and everybody solemnly clapping, you know, and uh, I'm looking around the room going, wow, people are very uh, anti hostile religion around here. Mm. <laughs> you know? And, um, and I remember it, it was just the cool thing to say. And it was the thing that could mm. get you applause, you know, and I remember about maybe fast forward 10 years after Martin Scorsese had made silence. Our Lord said to them, go ye into the whole world and preach the gospel to every living creature. Mm -hmm. And I am with the same people, the same Hollywood sort of people at the Egyptian theater for an evening with Martin Scorsese, you know, and Mar there's Martin Scorsese and, and, um, you know, all the actors from, uh, from silence, uh, you know, some of the writer, uh, you know, producer, I think the producer was there and he goes, yeah. Um, Famously, Martin Scorsese says, you know, I wanted to go to seminary, but instead I became a filmmaker and I'm, I'm trying to do the same things with uh, with my films as I would have been doing in seminary. And what it, hmm. the same exact kind of clapping, the same, hmm. you know, <laughs> I just well, it, and this like, is this like a, like Liam Neeson, uh, Andrew Garfield, like they're yes. they're there as well. Like Andrew Garfield was there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I know I've seen some stuff with Andrew Garfield talking about his. I can't remember if it was his faith, but I, I want to say his mother might have passed away. He he had a very he had a very traumatic um, death that that just just made him face some things, which mm -hmm. uh, seemed to leave him sort of sort of strengthened through that through through some pretty serious emotional wounds. So and how so. art itself helps you deal with grief? Yeah, um, <laughs> I love talking about it. By the way, so if I cry, it's only like. Mm -mm. It's only a beautiful thing. This is all the unexpressed love, right? The grief. Um, 
you you got my mind going all sorts of you know fun places um, you know I'm, I'm imagining this this scene and imagining these people then sort of recognize and this was after the film right these are these are people who had mm -hmm. seen the film and seen sort yeah. of yeah you know arguably one of his most spiritual films huh yeah and, and so, so it's it, and that was what t eight years ago Six yeah. years ago? It was probably okay. 2016, 2017-ish, maybe okay. earlier than that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, and, and I realized, you know, or just over the years that, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more going on with the human, with what you think, behind what you think, behind your beliefs, you know, behind, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, you know, there's status things that people are playing, you know, like, well, you know, is this going to, get me more status with the people I'm talking to versus that, mm. you know, there's, there's larger cultural trends going on related to things that are outside of your control, like technology. And you know, I mean, all kinds of things going on. And so um, there's no reason to be afraid. And it's, and it's kind of, kind of both ways too, right? I think, I think I remember a conversation with you and Paul Antleiter about sort of, um, maybe some critiques that you had had towards more propagandistic kind of Christ, you know, Christian, you know, film and storytelling. Like, uh, will you share a little bit more, more about that in terms of, you know, what, what you're trying to say to a certain audience? Is that kind of in the same, same vein of what you're talking about right now? Yeah. I mean, it just goes back to, again, like when you're, when you're making something, whether it's a movie or whether it's a musical piece or a sculpture, whatever it is, what's the reason behind why you're making it? You know, I'm very, very influenced by Nicholas Wolterstorff, theologian um, who came out of Calvin and went to Yale and a very in influential guy um, who wrote a book called Art in Action and says that art is defined by the by the action that it takes in the world. You know, so liturgical mm -hmm. art is for worshiping, memorial art is for mourning. Um, you know, the, if you want to know what mm -hmm. the purpose of it wow. is, you want to know what it's doing in the world. So the Christian, when you say Christian film, what most people are thinking of right there is a marketing category. Mm -hmm. So they're saying, this is the demographic that we are marketing this movie towards. You know, now that to, to me, that doesn't really say anything about the theological or uh, spiritual condition of the director <laughs> or the writer mm -hmm. or you know what exactly is being explored you know so if you're thinking of art in action what's the action that's taking in the world that's a separate question than who you're marketing it to you know mm -hmm. and so so a lot mm -hmm. of times you, you might say well um i'm not necessarily the one that they're marketing those christian movies to because they're, mm. they're going for it, let's say a, a little bit more of a low resolution, um, take on it or something like that, you know? And so th there's a, um, a critic named Alyssa Wilkinson who came out from Christianity today to Vox to the New York times now, and she's mm. a very good guide, uh, or barometer of what the more sophisticated crowd thinks a Christian film is. If you look at her mm. reviews, you'll see over time. And what has emerged is somebody like a Terrence Malick expressing uh, certain ideas through a very um, nonlinear form of mm. filmmaking. Um, Tarkovsky, um, uh, Ingmar Bergman, you know, the, mm. these are more sort of like, they're not, if they were books, they wouldn't be in the little pop section section they'd be in the sure. more yeah you know yeah. it'd be in the literature section you know um mm. so there's a lot of depth there um that could that goes into art making that um it's so so it just depends on the level of analysis you know if, if you're if you're saying okay what do i mean by a christian film and if you look at someone like terrence malick and you say well i think what i mean is that he's expressing a deeply christian idea that comes mm. out of western civilization through this film. Um, Guide us to the end of time. Unless you love, your life will flash by. And it, it, that doesn't say who it's being marketed to. That just says mm -hmm. something about the content of the film. 
Same thing with Paul Schrader. Paul Schrader wrote a book. Um, who he's the the <laughs> screenwriter for Martin Scorsese. We had him over at Fuller yeah. to give a, a talk one time, and he wrote a book called Transcendental Style, where he defines what he thinks a, a, a spiritual film is based on the style of the filmmaking. You know, so there's different mm. ways that you can look at it, and really it just depends on what you want to do as an artist. You know, and that will define what you're doing, um, not necessarily just who you're marketing it to. And so I think the same is true about a spiritual film. If you can make a Toy Story a spiritual film, well, what isn't a spiritual film? <laughs> um, you know, so I would much prefer to have a definition that is really quite narrow and functional than a, a definition that's broad and... Who, who? Okay, so I got a couple, couple of things just came up when you said that. First of all, my friend uh, Zach Little is a huge... Paul Schrader fan, so he's he's going to love that 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 you brought him up here. Um, and then, as as you're describing some of these things as being more implicit or or the outpouring of of the the art that the um, creator is trying to create, I, I'm thinking of Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ and how that you know whatever it was that was in him, you know, that came forth, you know, who was he marketing it to? Like, I, I've, I've read that it was a very personal, you know, film for him to, to create almost one that he needed to create more for himself than anyone else. Um, and then I also see that he's, you know, it's been over 20 years now since that came out and he's, he's filming a sequel or sequels um, to, to the passion and just so much has changed. Gosh, so it was, it would have come out in a pre social media era, um, among other things that have happened in the last 20 years. And I'm just wondering how, how do you have any thoughts or feelings about, about that film and, or his, and maybe you need to, you know, tread, tread lightly, you know, based on, you know, your, your, uh, your industry here, but, um, any, any yeah. thoughts on, on Mel Gibson? Well, I do remember, um, I didn't actually witness this, this event. Uh, it was told to me by the guy who uh, made VeggieTales. Remember VeggieTales? If you like to talk to tomatoes, if a squash can make you smile, if you like to waltz with potatoes, up and down the Have we got a show for you? Yeah. Oh yeah. He, he was he was doing a. Um, we used to have this thing at Biola called the Biola Media Conference, and we'd have speakers and stuff. So he was speaking there. He was telling about an experience with Mel Gibson. This wasn't too long after the Passion had come out, and he said that Mel Gibson was at an event. They said, "Okay, you you need to market this to Christians." Again, going back to the marketing thing. Mm -hmm. So you need to. Right. So he went to some evangelical event, and the <laughs> the moderator was pitching him softballs of like, all you have to do is say this and they'll mm -hmm. all go to the theater. This is one thing you have to say, <laughs> but mm -hmm. being a Catholic, he didn't know what that was. So he kept mm -hmm. swinging and missing at the, at the, so what he, so he was basically saying, he, here's what he was supposed to say. He was supposed to say, I hope that people's souls will be saved from watching this film. You know, that's what he was, or something along those lines. Sure. Sure. So he said, what do you hope to be happen? What do you hope will happen after this movie mm -hmm. comes out? And he'd say, well, uh, you know, I hope everybody likes it. I have this and that, you know, okay, let me try that again. And he <laughs> just kept pitching it to him. And finally he said, we well, need this to be of <laughs> eternal significance here, Mel. Come on, get the, get the point here. <laughs> right. Right. And so, um, finally, apparently he said, uh, you know, I, I just, I hope that there will be free ice cream. You know, he just kind of just <laughs> said something off the wall. Um, and so I really, you know, that's kind of sometimes the um, the interplay of of again, like I say, something that has a, a longer tradition and history of relationship between, let's say, religion and art, like the Orthodox or the Catholic, or even some of the older um, uh, Protestant denominations, versus something that is kind of a a, a this world like right now cultural phenomenon going on, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So th those two things are going to be a little bit different. And so in, in Mel's case, it seemed to me that he wanted to do this. And it came from, you know, some kind of place of his relationship to 
Catholicism. And so when evangelicals, evangelicals were going to it and they were putting their kind of lens on it, you know, they, they were mm. interpreting it based on now he did it. He, he, he based it on the stations of the cross. Yeah. Most, yeah. most <laughs> Protestants won't know what the stations well, of the cross well, is because they don't go. It was, into it. it was absolutely news to me. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. didn't understand like that, that created a curiosity to me to, to learn more about the stations of the cross. Once, once I saw this, I was like, wait, this isn't in my Bible. That was the <laughs> tradition that I was going to, you know, yeah. go, but go back to, um, but it also came out of that same sort of time period you were, you know, talking about that sort of post 9-11, Mm -hmm. you know, new, new atheist talk about Christianity, not being cool, you know, that, that, that came from that time, um, or, or, or spiritual things. Were, and now it's 2024. I mean, do you feel, what, 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 what are your thoughts about the, what his motivations and, or the, how the audience, you know, might be marketed to this time differently or not? Well, I think that right now it's just everything is um, is opening up. You know, you you just never know. Like at the time, I think that there was some very clear um, clicks. You might say, like a like a high school click, where you know, if you want to do this, you should say this. You know, if you want to mm. act this way, you know. Um, and uh, now it's it's just it's more open. Now it's sort of like if you wanted to make a spiritual film and you're in Hollywood, there's precedence for that now, mm. you know, after, after Scorsese, after Malick and, you know, so that maybe even the Mel Gibson thing was a, a little bit of a pre a proto version of that. Well, and it made a ton of money, right? Was, wasn't mm -hmm. it not like the highest grossing R rated film of all time until like Deadpool or something like that? Yeah. So that's another part of it. You know, if it makes money, people are going to, and this yeah. is to me like the anecdote about how everybody shifted the coolness factor of whether or not you're you're religious or spiritual. It's it's the same thing. It's like if the money is there, you know, people will change. You know, it's not it doesn't come from conviction. I would think. Uh, I mean, yeah. on the, on the very low resolution popular level, a lot of it doesn't come from you know. I decided this within my heart and conscience, and now that's how I act in the world. And this is the belief mm -hmm. that I hold and I put out there. It's more sort of like you're looking around what people are saying, and then you're, well, how can I fit in with that? And so if everybody's sure, saying, well, sure. we, we hate religion. And it's like, yeah, me too. You know, I, we, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then they're, we love it. You know, oh, yeah, uh, so do I. Yeah, so do we. <laughs> so do we. Yeah, we've been here all the time. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> well, um, now that we're kind of kind of caught up to to sort of what's what's current, what what are some of the things that you are are, are working on, or, or 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 maybe we actually didn't get to talk much about what what you've sort of done since you kind of graduated and became professional. Like, what are some of the projects that you're the most proud of that uh, we could direct people to, and then maybe going into that, you know, what you're working on now. Well, I mean, so uh, I work. Uh, my day job is I'm a camera guy, a camera technician, and I've, I've you know. I've, worked on a, a ton of movies over the years. Um, I have a couple of nonfiction projects in the hopper that aren't out yet. I'm not really sure where those sort of things, uh, I, I think the world of like uh, festivals and streaming flat platforms and things like that is a little in flux right now. So I'm, I haven't released hmm. anything in a while. Um, and uh, on my YouTube channel, I've been just going through uh, my own explorations of story structure um, mm -hmm. and looking at the seven basic plots, which is, uh, you know, the, the idea of the seven, seven archetypal or universal plots. Um, I can remember the day I found this very large tome sitting on my father's coffee table when I visited one Christmas. It represented 30 years of careful thought and study about what story is fundamentally about. And it's all part of my theory of, uh, of kind of doing a deep dive into what a, what a story is, what a narrative is. And it, it does relate to um, the, the way that people teach screenwriting, um, in Hollywood and, you know, at my school and other schools, um, just sort of how that developed post, uh, Star Wars, you know, because Star mm -hmm. Wars was so influenced by Joseph Campbell and, mm -hmm. and my desire really with my, with my weird eclectic <laughs> independent education is to sort of harm take in a little bit deeper, um, theological symbolic, um, ideas and look at that at, at how, how basic writing and storytelling is uh, is done uh, these days or taught these days and use it as kind of an experiment to see if I can 
get, you know, get uh, the the students that I advise um, to 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 be able to do what they really want and do something deeper, do something more, you know, um, let, you know, not just a formula to follow, but something to really use as a as a you could say a spiritual exploration. My little book that I wrote about documentary film, uh, which is called How to Film Truth, is about the idea of uh, filmmaking as a journey on foot or filmmaking as a process of discovery. You know, so it's kind of like a spiritual journey you're going on as an artist. I think a lot of times mm-hmm. that is what an artist is trying to do. They got this burning question about life and reality, and they're using different materials to work out um, the answer to that, or at least explore something within that in that vein. And so I'm, I'm kind of developing a, a theory of, um, uh, you could say it's, it's in the field of theology and art of, mm. um, you know, what, 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 what is a filmmaker, you know, what, what is, mm. what is a storyteller? Um, and then in along with that, what, it, what is a story? What does a story do for us? Why do we tell yeah, stories? Yeah. You know? And that was, you said you, you have a, a book on that and, and you, you have some YouTube content sort of on that as well, right? Yeah. So I just decided I, I, my book is, I wrote that back in 2018 and that was um, on nonfiction film on, on documentary film. And that, that's kind of like my little side world outside of my day job, which is the, um, which is camp working as a camera tech is small, small, non nonfiction film. Um, I, I sort of cut my teeth on a channel that did boxing little documentaries about boxers, you know, and, and then I have my little class, my one class that I teach, uh, on documentary, which is just an intro to documentary film. And I, and, um, and so that's kind of like my little world of students that I can use it as an experiment with, for my ideas, you know, mm-hmm. to see how well they, they, um, you know, if I say this, are they going to make something better versus that? And, um, now I have, you know, a, a bunch of students that are, that did very way better than I could do <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, in terms of, uh, documentaries and stories and, and, um, yeah, so I'm, I, I've taken on a little bit of a mentor-ish role with this. That was, that was literally what I was going to ask you. I was like, should I ask? Should I break up his train of thought? I was going to ask, like, talking about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and that so, sort of the role of the mentor. Do you, do you feel those relationships? Are like, like, are you still feeling some of that heroic, you know, journey to where you're, you're the hero and you've got work that you want to create and feel called to do, adventures you're called into? Um, or is it more of that you are seeing the, the, the calls in these younger people and realizing what sort of wisdom you can, um, impart on them in, in that more mentorship role? Like h- how much of that's a uh, balance in your life right now, the stage? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of both. I still have, um, I still have projects that I have in the hopper that are my, my film projects, you know, um, but more and more, yeah, I, I'm I'm starting to find that um, that 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 the next generation of you know, in my case, filmmakers, um, they they are very um, talented. The technology that they have access to is way better than the technology that I had, and mm-hmm. um, and I'm in a kind of a unique position of um, again, like because of all of these degrees I got and conversations I've had. In, to, to, to explore, um, without feeling, without feeling threatened, you know, um, mm. and, and to really kind of look in, you know, most of, I would say the found the philosophical foundation for Hollywood screenwriting books is Carl Jung because, mm. because it was successful because it went from Carl Jung mm. to Joseph Campbell to star Wars. Mm. And then Christopher Vogler, who worked, uh, who, who, basically wrote a book for screenwriting. Here, here's how you use this mythological stuff to make money. You know, here's how huh. you can have, make your stuff more That's universal. That's a new one for me. I'm going to look him up. He wrote a book called The Writer's Journey, and it was basically huh. Joseph Campbell Light for hmm. people who want to write screenplays. And it started as a memo. I think it was Disney that he worked at in the 90s or 80s. And it start, it, first it was just a memo that he put circulating through the, com- the, the company. And then eventually it became a book. And, and now that's one of the main things that people will use to say, okay, you want to make your film more universal, have a universal appeal. You mm-hmm. can tap into this mythological stuff, but sure. most of the time the writers will say, well, yeah, I think there's something there in terms of a universal collective unconscious or something, but I just use it to try to, 
you know, when I'm get stuck or something, I want to make it better, more universal. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is I want to say, um, well, let's really look at the foundation of this stuff and, and let's see what's going on. Let's look under the hood a little bit, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and rather than just, Hey, I mean, in star Wars, you know, I, I can't remember who said this, but there's this scene where they're in the trash compactor in star Wars. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to take them long to figure out what happened to us. Could be worse. <laughs> It's worse. You think, well, why is there a trash compactor in the middle of this Death Star in, that they wind up in with a well, thing? You don't want you don't want trash just out there in space. It needs to be compacted before you you know blast it out. You yeah, know, and there, why is there a, the a infinite monster, universe? A monster somehow got into this space station. You know, like this kind of slimy monster yeah, at the bottom of the. Now you're making me think about it too hard. You're like, oh no, yeah. Why why did that? Yeah. And the reason why is because that's the point in the cycle of Joseph C Campbell's hero's journey mm. of being in the belly of the beast. You know, that's mm. that. That's the. So we the, need we need a beast and we need so a belly, and put, so yeah. So it's like you know George Lucas kind of stuffed it into that formula, and lo and behold, even though it doesn't really make sense, it yeah, just, I don't think about it too hard. <laughs> it, it blew everyone. Away. Everyone loved it, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, but I mean, I think you could say, well, if you really did want to use a little bit more of that stuff, you could find a way to make it actually organic in the story rather than just mm. imposed upon it, you know? Um, so it's stuff like that, you know, that, that I'm, that I'm kind of doing a deep dive and on, on my YouTube channel, I just did a, did a playlist called the seven basic plots mm -hmm. and just going through. And what's nice about YouTube is you can just experiment. And it, for me, it's kind of, once I teach a class once, I do okay. And then the second time I do a little bit better. And by the time I teach it a third time, I've got it down. Mm. And the, what I found with the YouTube videos is that it's almost as if I've already taught it once. When I force myself to, mm. to record a lecture, I may have to do that several recording things. is like teaching it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and are you getting, are you getting good uh, interaction and, and comments and, and like, um, where do people tend to interact with you for your content? Is it Twitter? Is it Instagram? Is it, is it YouTube so, somewhere else? Um, well, Twitter, it seems like it's mostly people that are part of this little corner of the internet that have found me because I tweeted about Jonathan Peugeot or Matthew Peugeot mm -hmm. or something like that. And then mm -hmm. YouTube is is more um, people that just are probably looking to write a novel or, you know, write a screenplay or something and stumbled upon my channel and kind of cool. work their way through the lectures. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, I, I, it's it's not... I'm not trying to get a lot of views or make it go viral or anything. Like I said, it's, it's mostly just, I would like to eventually develop a course, let's say on the seven basic plots mm -hmm. and be able to teach that to masters level screenwriters and see like mm. maybe what would they make? You know, the same thing with my little documentary class. It's like, mm. I, I, I kept refining it every time they, I said something and they made something good. I did. Okay. I'm keeping mm. that. And if I said something that just confused them, they went, ah, oh, that doesn't help me. <laughs> I took it out, you know? There's your feedback so mechanism. Kind of, yeah, that's my method, yeah. That's really cool. I, I'm, imagining, um, I'm imagining one of your students at an award ceremony somewhere, like, thanking you, you know, saying, like, this, this unlocked something within me, and uh, I just want to thank Professor Justin for, you know, for what, whatever happened, I can, I can see sort of that being part of the motivation for what you're doing. So, well, I, I want to encourage you in, in, in doing that. I think, I think it's great. I think you have a good, my sense, my projection is you do have a good balance of, of doing your own thing and leaving breadcrumbs, um, even intentionally, you know, for, for others to find and learn from and benefit from. And, uh, I've, I've looked at several of your videos and really enjoy them. And it's, it's similar to some of the challenges that I have with with my videos is that they they do have these very helpful visual, um, it, not, not just illustrations, but it's like I need to sort of watch it. Like you you create something that is also very visually engaging and helpful to understand. A lot of times I can just turn on um, a conversation, you know, Paul Paul Vander Clay and somebody else, and it's I can just listen kind of audio only. Uh, but with your content, it's 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 very much 
utilizing the eye that you have developed as a cinematographer and, and a storyteller. And so um, I think it's great. I want to encourage you to keep doing it. I'm, I'm excited that this coffee project has, you know, has legs, you know, it, it seems. And even if just, you know, a couple people, you know, buy the coffee and, you know, raise, raise a glass to it. Um, I think it'll, it'll be worth it. And um, yeah, I appreciate you know, the time you had to, to work on the coffee project with me and, and where it goes from here and, you know, spend yeah. a little while on, uh, on camera, getting to know each other a little better. Yeah, totally. And it'll be a perfect uh, morning coffee for me too, since, since okay. I, well, it. well, good. And then I did, uh, I did I, the I, last my, um, I've got family out in LA. So, you know, the next time I'm out there, we'll, uh, we'll do this in person and uh, raise a, raise a glass together. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I did um, the last round. I brought in a buddy of mine who I trust his palate very much. Was and it the he, same? Was it the same college buddy or no, a, a different, different buddy. The new coffee mentor? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just a, a buddy of mine that he likes coffee. I mean, he, he's, he knows what he's, he, he's very honest with his, uh, with what he likes and doesn't like. Yeah. And I just said, Hey, I want to make sure I'm not crazy. Do these taste good? <laughs> we tried all three <laughs> and we both independently came to the same conclusion of the one that I finally chose. This, this, this is the one. Yeah. That's, that, that's the one. Cause yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's hard. Like we, 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 we know each other. We know some of the same people. I think we, we want to like each other. We want to, to be accepted by each other. And so maybe you would, no matter how hard you tried, be thinking like, well, I, I want to like this coffee. So that's good to hear that you've got something that could hopefully override, you know, that, that tendency to, to want to like it. Mm -hmm. And you actually do like it. Yeah. I do. So, all right. Well, cheers. Well, I appreciate it. Um, I'll, uh, we will talk again soon. And again, it might be actually over coffee. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Zach. I'm in. Do a rockapella! Well, she sneaks around the world from Vienna to Carolina. She's a sticky finger filter from Berlin down to Belize. Take you for a ride on a low bus to China down there.